The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. I'm happy to welcome you tonight to our final World Beyond the Headlines of the winter quarter, um, 2012. The World Beyond the Headlines, as uh, many of you know, is a project of the Center for International Studies. And tonight we're um, pleased to have our event co-sponsored by the International House Global Voices Program and our friends at the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. All of our World Beyond the Headlines series are um, recorded and are available for downloading at our website, cis.uchicago.edu, where you can also get information on our upcoming spring quarter events. And let me just mention um, a very exciting and I think um, going to be high profile, excellent series that we have set up for the spring on food security and insecurity. So please keep an eye out for this um, important event. Tonight we're um, very, very pleased to welcome, uh, welcome Charles Kupchin, who is Professor of International Affairs at Georgetown University and also the Whitney Shepherdson Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Professor Kupchin was Director for European Affairs at the National Security Council during the first Clinton administration, and before that worked in the U.S. Department of State on the policy planning staff. He's the author of a terrifyingly large number of books, uh, including How Enemies Become Friends, The End of the American Era, um, and Power Transition, The Peaceful Change of International Order. Tonight he'll be discussing his latest book, uh, no One's World, The West, The Rising Rest, and The Coming Global Turn. We do have copies of the books here tonight, um, courtesy Seminary Co-op. You can see the table in the back of the room. Um, and following the talk and the question and answer, there will be book signings and books uh, available for purchase. So please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Carl, Charles Kupchin. The issue that I would like to discuss tonight is what the world of the 21st century is going to look like. And I will spill the beans right off the bat so you know where I'm going, and then I'll back up and tell a little bit of a story. Uh, and the gist of what I have to say is uh, as follows, that between 1500 and 1800, the world underwent what I would call a global turn. Power shifted from the Mesopotamian Valley and what is today called Asia, and in particular East Asia, to the West and to the North. And by the beginning of the 19th century, the so-called West, which at that time was really Northern Europe, had pulled ahead of the rest of the world. And the story of the 19th and the 20th centuries is essentially one in which the West, decade by decade, established first material and then ideological hegemony. And there has been uh, an assumption that the power of the West, coupled with the appeal of its ideas, will lead to the universalization of Western values and the Western order democratization, liberal order, free trade, and that even if, as many people now accept, the era of, West, of the West's material primacy will not last, its ideological hegemony, the order that the world has, has come to via the West, is here to stay. And I would like to cast doubt on that narrative and suggest that we are entering a new global turn, a new moment in history in which the pendulum is swinging, in which the locus of gravity in international politics is again moving. And by 2030, 2040, certain, certainly by 2050, we will no longer live in a world in which the West enjoys material dominance. And I'm going to argue, nor will we live in a world in which the West enjoys ideological dominance. You might ask, well, who is then going to dominate? And my answer tonight will be, no one. And that's why the title of the book is No One's World. And that's why I think the world that we are heading into 
is going to be novel. It will be historically unprecedented. And it will not be historically unprecedented because it will be multipolar and will consist of different political models, but it will be unprecedented because it will be the first time in history that a world that is globalized and interdependent will consist of multiple versions of modernity and competing conceptions of how to organize economic and political life. Because if we go back to the era prior to Western hegemony, let's say 1700, there was the Holy Roman Empire, and then the Ottomans, and then the Mughals, and then the Chinese, the Qing Dynasty, and a little further to the east, the Tokugawa shogunate in Japan, and they each marched to their own drummer. Each ran its affairs according to its own socioeconomic and cultural principles, but each was a self-contained compartment. There was very little interpenetration or interconnection between each of those centers of power, and therefore nobody really cared how to deal with global governance, how to deal with currency rates, what our conceptions of legitimacy and sovereignty could be, because each had its own conceptions of legitimacy and sovereignty, and they didn't care what the guy next door thought. Well, we now live in a world in which we are so smushed together, to put it technically, that we do care what happens in Beijing and in Brussels and in New Delhi and in Brasilia. And decisions that they make affect what's happening here in the United States. And that's why I think we are moving to a world that is, to, that is interconnected and globalized, but in which we will, for the first time, have these competing conceptions of modernity, competing conceptions of how to organize political and social life. They're going to go head to head. We need to find a consensus. We need to build a set of norms, rules, and institutions to deal with that globalized world, but it's going to be much more difficult than it has been for the last several hundred years because no longer will there be a driver. No longer will there be a lender or provider of last resort. And that's because the United States and its Western allies will have neither the material wherewithal nor the ideological do dominance to be that provider of last resort. So what I'd like to do is spend 15 minutes or so telling you how and why I come to that conclusion about where we're headed, and then end by offering some thoughts on what we might do about it. The story that I'm going to begin with is the story of how the West came to be the West. How is it that we, and I'll use we because we happen to be in Chicago, which is in the United States, which is a card-carrying member of the Western world. How did we come to be us? And the defining features of the Western world are, in my mind, liberal democracy, industrial capitalism, and secular nationalism. So let me just take five, five minutes or so and, and, and tell you the story of how I think we became us. But before I do that, let me tell you why I'm going to tell you that story. A question that is before us, if I'm right, that we are ending, getting to the end of the era of Western hegemony is, is the rest of the world following the same path of modernity that we did? Is the, West, uh, is the rest of the world going to embrace liberal democracy, industrial capitalism, and secular nationalism, and look like us? Because if they do, then managing the 21st century is going to be much easier than if they don't. Because then we will agree on norms. We will agree on legitimacy. We will agree on the fundamental rules of the road. So the first question I want to ask is, how did the West become the West? And only then can I answer, is the rest going to follow that route, or is it going to take its own path to modernity? So I think that understanding the, the evolution of the Western world requires going back to the 10th century, when the Holy Roman Empire was born after the collapse of the Carolingian Empire. And as historians like to say, the Holy Roman Empire was not holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. I want to focus on 
first why it wasn't an empire. It wasn't an empire because it, it was fragmented. It was an empire without a hierarchical, top-down, political, institutional structure. And that's because of feudalism. After the end of the Carolingian Empire, what happened is that land was privatized. Cavalry that used to serve exclusively the monarch began to serve feudal lords, the nobility. And one began to see across the European landscape independent feudal fiefdoms with knights and vassals and serfs that began to populate a fragmented and divided landscape. And those independent fiefs began to push back against the main institutions of power that had controlled Europe since the Roman times, and those were the monarchy and the church. And not only did these independent fiefdoms and the beginnings of an independent commercial class push back against them, but the monarch and the pope started to fight with each other. And the pope started to fight with the bishops. And the bishops started to fight with the priests. And in the weakness of Europe lay its strength. And that's because over time, you began to see small clusters of artisans, merchants, professionals, bankers, co people who wrote contracts emerge in these gaps between monarch and church. And they began to enjoy a level of political and economic independence that no one else in the world enjoyed. And by the 14th and 15th century, you are seeing new cities, not big cities, small cities born throughout Central and Northern and Western Europe that in many respects were the vanguard, the leading edge of the rise of the West. First, because they were commercialized and they had an entrepreneurial spirit and independence that didn't exist anywhere else. And secondly, because they became the, the magnet for the message of the Reformation, so that when Calvin and Zwingli and Luther started preaching the Protestant message, the idea of individual faith, the idea that a clergy wasn't needed to mediate between man and the Almighty, the commercial elite rushed to grab onto this new message because it gave them more independence, more individualism. And if you were to put up a map of Europe and say, which part turned Protestant and which part stayed Catholic, the answer is that the commercialized parts became Protestant and the agrarian parts stayed Catholic. With some exceptions, Italy was an exception, and we can talk about why later. But the reason that the commercialized parts of Europe turned to Protestantism and the agrarian did not is that the commercial elite wanted that message. They wanted the independence that came with it. And with the Reformation came political and religious pluralism. Religious pluralism first, because even though the Pope and the Holy Roman Empire tried to suppress Protestantism, they failed. And after the Thirty Years' War, the Peace of Westphalia basically said, if we're going to live alongside each other, we have to tolerate each other's religions. And this war between Catholics and Protestants also led to political liberalism. Because when monarchs started to raise armies to fight each other, they needed money. Who had money? The merchants, the artisans. And they said to the monarchs, sure, we'll give you money, but in return, we want political voice. And that's the effective bargain that was struck between the new bourgeoisie and parliamentarians against the monarch in England in 1688 in the Glorious Revolution. And it was that formula, money to the monarch in return for political voice, that gradually spread constitutional monarchy across Europe. And eventually, this bourgeoisie that was pushing back against the church and the monarchy also served as the leading edge, the vanguard of the Industrial Revolution providing the entrepreneurial spirit, 
the printing presses, the beginnings of modern science, rationalism, that enabled Europe by 1800 to be way ahead of the rest of the world. And people sometimes portray the Ottoman Empire or the Mughal Empire as weak. And they were not weak. They were strong. And it's precisely because they were strong that they fell behind Europe. And that's because control, hierarchical control, top-down control, prevented the kinds of entrepreneurial, intellectual, financial dynamism that Europe's commercial bourgeoisie was able to bring to a fragmented and weak imperial structure. The final part of the story is industrial revolution leads to the empowerment of masses. Our societies become 75% urbanized and industrialized, 25% agrarian. And the influx of workers into the political realm was essentially what led to the onset of universal suffrage and liberal democracy. So standing on one foot in eight minutes, I have uh, 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 basically tried to give you my sense of what, what, uh, how the West was. I hope there are no historians in the room, because if, the, if there are, I'm sure they would slaughter this account. But that's, a, that's the, the story that I tell in the book and, it's, and the quick and dirty version uh, of the story that I want to share with you tonight. So that gets me to the second issue I want to raise, uh, and that is what's happening elsewhere. Are we seeing this version of modernity replicated? Is China, India, Brazil, Egypt, are these countries following that same socioeconomic and cultural pattern? And therefore, will they look like us as they modernize and as they take their place at the top of the international hierarchy? And just to give you some data points to, to, to share with you where we are in this turn, during most, most of the Cold War, the West represented about 75% of global GDP. The West now represents 50% of global GDP. In a couple decades, we'll be down to 30%. In 2010, the top five economies of the world, except one, China, are all Western. In three decades, that pecking order will be completely upside down. The five top economies in the world will be all non-Western. One country will make the grade, us, number two, and we will be miles behind China, about 60% of the wealth of China. Goldman Sachs predicts that the Chinese economy will overtake the American economy in 2027. The World Bank predicts that in 2025, there will be three dominant currencies in the world, the dollar, the euro, and the Chinese renminbi. Goldman Sachs predicts that in 2032, the BRICS economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, will, today, will surpass the wealth of the industrialized economies, the top seven industrialized economies. So that just gives you some sense of the scope of change over the next couple of decades and the pace of change. This is not something that's going to occur over generations. It's something that's going to occur over the next decade or two during most of our lifetimes. So that brings me to this question. Are these other countries going to look like us? Are they following our path to modernity? When we get to 2032 and there is a relatively equal distribution of global wealth, Will they play by our rules? And let me just give you a sampling of some of the reasons that I think the answer is definitively no. Let's begin with China. As I mentioned, I think the story of our own rise is the story of the independence of the bourgeoisie and the middle class pushing back against the state, and a state that held its ground, tried to prevent that from happening, and lost. And in the end of the day, had to grant the bourgeoisie political rights because it needed the money. I think what we have seen in China and in many other emerging powers is a very different relationship between the state and the middle class. China has effectively co-opted its middle class. Russia has effectively cowed its middle class. But the result is 
that most Russians and most Chinese today are not at the vanguard of political change. Most Chinese who are part of the middle class are vested in keeping the political status quo as it is. 83% of the citizens of China believe their country is headed in the right direction. The number in the United States is 23%. We think 23% of Americans think we're headed in the right direction. That kind of data leads me to believe that we are not at the beginning of an era in which China is going to emerge as a liberal democracy. It might. In fact, I would guess that it probably will. But if so, it's going to happen much slower and much after China emerges as the world's leading economy. A second issue. We now live in a world in which the global system is extremely fast, extremely fluid, and extremely unpredictable. When we rose to power the Western world, the international system was fragmented, slow, sluggish, not interconnected. We were led to believe during the era of globalization that it's our societies that would benefit the most from globalization. Well, it hasn't worked out that way. And societies like China that exercise state capitalism that keep a much higher, tighter hand on the tiller are actually doing much better than open, liberal, laissez-faire economies precisely because we live in a world in which more control works better than less control. And so when countries around the world are looking out and they are watching China grow at 10% per year, they are watching four to 500 million Chinese grow out of poverty. They are watching a country that is able to do things at the level of infrastructure that we can only dream about. They're not necessarily going to say to themselves, let's follow Washington. Now, is China going to sweep the world? Is the Chinese model replicable elsewhere? Don't bet on it. It depends upon socioeconomic and cultural conditions that are unique to China, including a Confucian communitarian tradition, including a meritocratic government that produces quite impressive leadership, including a transportation and industrial infrastructure that most countries will never have and could never even think about. But it also has a downside. The illegitimacy that comes with non-democracy, the corruption that comes with a one-party state. And so for a lot of reasons, it's not going to be globalized, but it will, I would argue, hold its own. So as we think about 2030, 2035, 2040, I would bet that state capitalism, that countries that look like China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, UAE, countries that have relatively free markets but state-led growth and state-led governance will be out there competing in the marketplace of ideas with the Western brand of free markets and liberal democracy. And if the last couple of decades are any indication, we will do fine but our model will not be so superior, its performance sufficiently better than the rest, that it wins out. Let me just switch over to the Middle East. Well, one could say, this guy Kupchin doesn't know what he's talking about. The Middle East, after a long period of coercion and autocracy, is breaking America's way. After all, what is the Arab Spring about? What's happening in Tunisia? What's happening in Syria? They want dignity. They want democracy. They do want to follow the Western path of modernity. And my answer to that is yes. What's happening in the Middle East is uplifting. When people want dignity and respect, it, is, it resonates with our own experience and our own values and our own ideals. But what's going to come out at the other end? What kind of political mental map is likely to emerge from this process of democratization. I see one fundamental and defining difference between the world of political Islam and the world of Western democracy, and that is the relationship between church and state. We came 
to life as the Western world after the Reformation. When we crystallized as nation states, we did so with the church outside the political realm. It varies from country to country, but the Reformation was in many respects a turning point. In fact, from the very beginning, there has been a realm that's sacred and a realm that's secular. The pope and the emperor were always distinguishable. And the pope had political power only by allying himself with secular rulers. And then after the Reformation, you see essentially the separation of the monarchy and the pope, and an increasing sense that political life and, and religious life should be separate. And that, I think, is part and parcel of the Western world. It is part of Western Christendom. Christendom is a religion of faith. It is not a religion of law. In the Middle East, in the Muslim world, there is no distinction between the sacred and the secular. There has never been a distinction between mosque and state. There is even no terminology in Arabic or Farsi to make these distinctions. Islam is a religion of law and faith. Islam is a religion that is political. And therefore, it is not surprising and should not be surprising that as coercive regimes fall, as secular dictators are knocked off, what we're seeing as a consequence is not secular liberal democracy, but some strange hybrid mix of participatory politics and political Islam. And it's not just in Tunisia and Egypt that the Muslim Brotherhood and more extremist Islamists have won. It's in every country that has held elections. Algeria, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Turkey, Palestinian Authority, you name it, if there has been participatory election, the Islamists have won or have strengthened their case. Now, I'm not saying that there's, there's anything wrong with that. I think there are certain brands of political Islam that I would have problems with. I'm simply saying it's different. And when two-thirds of the Egyptian public in a recent poll says that they want civil law to follow the Quran, it's a different world than the world that we've been living in. And it says to me that if we think at the end of the Arab Spring, we will see a Muslim Middle East that plays by the same rules of the liberal democratic secular West, I think we're living in la-la land. And it probably doesn't make sense for us to continue to support, strongly support secular parties in a country like Egypt when the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis have just swept parliamentary elections and are likely to continue to dominate the political landscape for the foreseeable future. Let me end this sort of global meandering with a quick comment on two countries that you might think should be lining with us should be following in our footsteps, and that's because they're democracies, Brazil and India. The two members of the so-called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China grouping that are card-carrying democracies and stable democracies. India, for about most of its modern history, and Brazil since the mid-1980s. Well, I think what we're seeing in, in, in Brazil and India are countries that, to some extent, are following the Western path, but that there is a very different, a very uh, different socioeconomic complexion. And as I mentioned, when we became liberal democratic societies, we were largely urbanized, industrialized with a strong middle class. That is not the pattern that is being followed in India and in China, or most of Latin America for that matter. These countries are democratizing why the vast majority of their populations are urban and rural poor. And that makes, means that there is a strong strain of left-wing populism. There is a strong suspicion of the West. There is a strong hesitancy to embrace free market capitalism. And that's because even a country like Brazil, which has adhered to a relatively responsible fiscal macroeconomic policy embraces policies of income redistribution because they have to 
given the biting economic inequality that exists in a country like Brazil or India. And so the test for me is not, does Brazil or India have democratic institutions? The answer is yes, they do. It's will those democratic institutions encourage them to follow in the footsteps of the West and to play by the rules of the West? And the answer is don't count on it. India is supposedly our newest strategic partner, but we have really one main interest in common, hedging against the rise of China. We are miles apart on Afghanistan, Pakistan, trade, the environment, and Iran. Iran is probably at the top of our list of national security priorities as I speak tonight. India is in the midst of dispatching a trade mission to Tehran to deepen its economic links when we're trying to tighten sanctions. Brazil votes with the United States in the UN Security Council, in the UN General Assembly, under 25% of the time. India, 20% of the time. So that just gives you some sense as to whether we are moving into a world in which there is global convergence and in which the West will enjoy the followership of others, or whether we are moving into a world that will be characterized by multiple versions of modernity and multiple ideological approaches to how to organize domestic and international life. Let me begin to conclude by addressing two issues of, well, what do we do? What do we make of this? How should we respond? And first, I want to talk a little bit about the West. And then I want to talk about what kinds of rules I think we might be able to agree on as we ruminate and debate about a, what you could call, post-Western order. For starters, I think that it is unfortunate but not accidental that the West is in a period of political and economic distress at the same time that this global turn has begun. I think it is particularly unfortunate because this global turn requires Western management. It requires the West to be in the game. It requires the West to have its lights on and its wits about it. But I think that right now, in this country, we are faced with a political dysfunction that most of us never thought could befall the United States. The European Union is facing a potential collapse of the Eurozone, although things actually look better now than they did a couple of months ago. But it is facing, I think without question, its greatest political crisis since it was born after World War II. And Japan, the other part of the Western Troika, is flat on its back. The average Japanese prime minister these days lasts about six days. That's an exaggeration, but I think we've had six prime ministers over the last five years. The DPJ and the LDP, the two main parties, are as internally divided as they are at odds with each other. It took 100 days, 100 days for the Japanese diet to pass legislation to get reconstruction assistance up to Fukushima because they, they couldn't get agreement within the legislature. In other words, we are passing through a, a very serious period of paralysis might be putting it too strongly, but something bordering paralysis. And I think that there's a connection to the rise of the rest, to what's happening in India, China, Brazil, Turkey, Indonesia, and that is that globalization is having a fundamentally dislocating effect on our societies. And that dislocation is fundamentally economic, but it goes beyond economic. And if I had to put my finger on one factor that is at the heart of what one could call the democratic crisis, or the crisis of governance in the West, it is the fact that our middle classes, the middle class upon which the West rose 
is in distress. Middle class incomes have been declining for two decades. Income inequality has been going through the roof. The United States is now the most unequal country in the industrialized world. And Americans, I think, for the first time in history, worry that their kids are going to lead a less comfortable life than they. And it's that distress, that bursting of the bubble, that sense that the American dream could be dissipating that I think is at the heart of our political polarization. It is bringing back ideological cleavages that we haven't seen since the 19th century. Those ideological cleavages are running along regional lines, making them more intractable. And they are intersecting <clears throat> in very odd ways with culture wars. But again, I think it's fundamentally an economic problem. Our big, sweet middle in American politics was born after World War II, and it was born on the backs of prosperity. The boom that emerged in the 1940s and 1950s floated everybody's boat. And for the first time in American history, there was a big bipartisan center, moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans. If you took a snapshot of the congressional delegation in Congress from New England in 1960, it would be about 50-50. If you take it today, you probably wouldn't find a single Republican. If you come out to the Mountain West, you would have found 50-50 today, mostly Republican. So what's happened is we're seeing a regional polarization that is being fostered by and in, and, and in some ways intensifying the ideological polarization that has been born of economic distress. And so I think the first answer I would give you as to what we need to do to deal with this global turn is solve this problem, is get our mojo back. Because it seems to me it is a, a dangerous enough period in history with the United States with its lights on. It's a particularly dangerous period as the country that remains at the top of the heap and will remain at the top of the heap for the next few decades isn't able to provide leadership, isn't able to provide effective guidance. And so the first thing I think we need to do is figure out how to restore adequate incomes to our middle classes, figure out how to restore a political center to American politics, figure out how to prevent the renationalization of Europe. Because I do think that it is vital to restore the Western democratic core precisely because that Western democratic core is losing its long era of primacy. And that means that we need to anchor this global turn, do what we can to ensure that the values continue to remain strong, but it's hard to do that at a period in which we are so internally divided and struggling economically. The final comment I'll make is that I think we need to begin to think about a new set of ordering norms, a new set of ideas which would serve as a basis for a consensus, a compromise, between what I would call our world and the world that is emerging around us. And rather than viewing liberal democracy as the litmus test of legitimacy, I would argue that we should take responsible governance as the litmus test, that countries that govern so as to increase the welfare of their citizens, countries that govern so as to give their citizens better chances in life are above the bar. And to stop delegitimating governments just because we don't like the way that they govern at home. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't protest violations of human rights. It doesn't mean that when China arrests a political prisoner, we shouldn't protest. But it seems we do ourselves no good when we go around the world delegitimating other governments with whom we need to work rather than respecting the choices that they make 
based upon their own socioeconomic and their own cultural patterns about how they run their own affairs. And I think if we did that, if we treated with greater respect the Chinas and the Russias of the world, we would get more cooperation confronting the countries that we should not respect. What's happening with Syria right now is, I think, a perfect example. We need Russia and China on our side. I'm not giving China and Russia a, a pass on vetoing the UN resolution on Syria, but I do think that if our diplomacy were better, we would have them voting with us, and we would prevent the kinds of atrocities that are taking place in countries like Syria or Sudan. Those are the countries we should really be worried about, and I think we should spend less time haranguing against the Russias and Chinas of the world because they aren't practicing politics of the sort that we think is the right way to go. A second thought I have in this regard is I think that we should begin to think more about the regional devolution of authority. If I'm right that the next world is a world in which there isn't a global center of gravity, in which there isn't a dominant political model, then that next world's probably gonna be more regional. And rather than trying to aggregate things up, let's start looking to local organizations, the African Union, Mercosur in Latin America, the Gulf Cooperation Council in the Persian Gulf region, ASEAN, and whatever emerges in Northeast Asia, I think these in many respects will be the most important and vital institutions of the 21st century. Finally, I think that the United States needs to not just change some of the rules and norms that it, it offers to the world, but also find a less onerous and to some extent a less ambitious brand of statecraft. And I say that in part because I think right now we have a, a foreign policy that is losing its political traction. We have commitments around the world that extend beyond our interests. I think the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have been black holes. I think the sooner we get out of Afghanistan, the better. And to some extent, if there is a sweet spot in American politics over the next few years, I think it is in fact gravitating toward a modest retrenchment, toward a more judicious kind of foreign policy. And I think returning to a narrower view of what our interests are, focusing on those interests more narrowly, saving ourselves from trying to fix countries like Iraq is a much more sensible way to go than frittering and flailing away in the way that we have been doing for the past decade. And at the same time, that retrenchment, that lighter load, I think will make room, will give wider berth to precisely those countries that feel that they want more say, that they feel that they want a seat at the table. But I think the biggest mistake that we can make is to assume that they want to take a seat at our table and that the challenge of the 21st century is to fling open those doors at the back of this room and invite the Chinese and the Indians and the Brazilians and the Turks and the others in and offer them a seat here. Because I think they're going to ask us to come and sit at their table or to find a new table. And that managing no one's world, managing a world of, multi of multiple modernities but that is nonetheless squished together is going to be extraordinarily difficult and challenging, but I think if we get it right, it could well be an era not, not that is ominous or dark, but one in which the world's diversity, in fact, brings us to a new level of prosperity and perhaps even comedy. But I think we need to realize that this turn is happening, and the biggest mistake that we can make is to stick our heads in the sand and to pretend otherwise. Thank you. Thanks very much. We, we do have some time for questions from the audience, and I would ask you to please step forward to the microphone because we are re a recording, uh, so that will make it possible for the recording, and please do try and be concise in your questioning. 
the question is, you're talking about retrenchment in our foreign policy, but then you started with stating that Iran is the most urgent security issue for the United States. So it seems like you're, to me, at least there's some contradiction there. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to do with Iran what was done with Iraq and Afghanistan, I assume. So, any comment there? I think that there are certain parts of the world where a lighter American footprint is not only um, feasible but desirable. And those would include Europe where we're in the process of, of downsizing to something along the lines of 30,000 troops, and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. We're already out of Iraq, uh, and we may be getting out of Afghanistan sooner than planned. Who knows? But what's happened over the last week certainly, uh, it, I think, is going to, to create a, a, a rethink about the mission in Afghanistan. I don't think that this is a, a point in time in which retrenchment vis-a-vis -vis Iran makes sense. Uh, I believe that uh, the prospect of a nuclear Iran is not an inviting prospect. Uh, there are people in the political community, and some of whom are actually here at the University of Chicago, who are comfortable with a nuclear Iran and who believe that if Iran has nuclear weapons, it will behave just like any other country with nuclear weapons, that it will be cautious, that it will be restrained. And my answer to that is, I don't know, but I don't want to find out. Uh, and as a consequence, I think that the Obama administration should be doing everything in its power to find some kind of diplomatic resolution to this crisis. Uh, and I think the ideas that are floating around today are the right ideas. Some kind of deal that would allow Iran to have a rudimentary enrichment process in the country in return for a very tight inspection of its fuel cycle to make sure that it does not enrich to weapons-grade plutonium or produce nuclear weapons. If that deal is not forthcoming, and I don't give it a high likelihood, uh, then I think we face two very unpleasant choices, living with a nuclear Iran or bombing Iran. I think both of those are very unattractive, unappetizing choices. And that's why I would put an enormous amount of effort right now on the diplomatic front and hope that it works. Thank you for being such a, a good and well-behaved audience. I think that we have just about the right number of people in the line, so uh, no more. <laughs> good evening, and thank you. In a sense, to answer the second part of my question about the nuclear weapons, but I had two questions, uh, actually. One would be about Russia. Um, I wanted to find out from you what within Russia's internal uh, politics and policy internationally, what makes you think that they will succeed as economically because Russia has weird ways of doing things? And the second was um, about nuclear weapons, the weapons that already exist and in this world with no precise leadership, um, how do you think we will deal with it? Thank you very much. With nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, yes. Thank you. I think that, that um, Russia will continue to benefit from the fact that the world functions and, and, and lies on fossil fuel. Oil prices are rising. They will probably continue to rise. If, if things with Iran get worse, they're going to keep going up and up. Uh, and that's good news for Russia because uh, the Russian economy is heavily dependent upon oil and gas. I don't see that changing. Uh, the, what I don't know is whether, whether Putin, since he's probably going to be the next president, will have the good sense to liberalize the economy and do some of the things that Medvedev and others were talking about uh, during this last presidency. Uh, I hope that they do. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, I, I think that the protests that we're seeing in Russia today are important. I think that they represent uh, 
a, a beginning of some kind of political evolution in Russia, but I don't believe that we are witnessing uh, a Russian spring. Uh, and I think it's important to keep in mind that even though Russia has, by the numbers, a middle class that's about 30% of the population, the real middle class is much less than that, maybe 10%. And the rest of those 20% that call themselves middle class are all in the state bureaucracy. Uh, and, they, and they therefore don't really function in the same way. The people in the streets are that 10% more the intelligentsia, the, the private sector, the entrepreneurs, I'm not sure that's enough to turn the country around. Uh, I do think, on the upside, that, that Russia is going to be looking west, and that over time, Russia will find its home in Europe. Uh, and I think that's a good, good for Russia and good for Europe, but it's just going to take uh, time for that to happen. On nuclear weapons, uh, you know, I, I think it's a huge concern. Uh, and, and the biggest concern to me about North Korea and Iran, coming back to Iran, is not that they're actually going to use nuclear weapons, right? Is Iran really going to launch a ballistic missile with a warhead on top and destroy Israel? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, what I do worry about is the technology to produce nuclear weapons and the material to produce nuclear weapons in countries that don't enjoy uh, unitary control and that have a track record of sponsoring terrorists and relationships to shady organizations, right? That's the real danger, that a nuclear weapon will fall into the hands of a country or a state, it really a, a non-state actor that cannot be deterred. And I think we should be putting more and more emphasis on that and I think the Chinese and the Russians and others will share that emphasis because they should be as scared about it as we are. Please. Yes. I wanted to ask, you mentioned that you were concerned that uh, we're going through this global turn at a time when the United States is going through economic crisis and uh, that we, the United States and the West could provide leadership. I'm wondering in what ways other um, of these rising countries can provide leadership, how that might be positive or negative, and how it might be complementary uh, to the sort of leadership that the, United, the West has provided. Uh, and I, think, I was thinking, for example, about development in Africa and how China and United in the West pro provide different, um, perhaps, benefits in terms of leadership, different resources, play a different role in that task. And how you see, perhaps, maybe these different um, leadership roles um, and what the countries can provide and the political models, economic models, models they're providing might be complementary in a beneficial way. You know, I, I think that the, um, we, we're having a, a debate in this country about this very issue. Uh, I, I would say that, that I'm probably in the minority. Uh, some of you maybe have recently seen Robert Kagan's work in The New Republic or his new book. He's saying exactly the opposite, that if people think that I'm right, we will commit what he calls preemptive superpower suicide and that the worst thing we can do is to think that we're in a global turn, to think that we're in declining, because then we're going to behave as if we are, and then the roof is going to fall in. Uh, my argument is exactly the opposite. We need to do now what Britain did after 1870. Right? Britain was at the top of the world in 1870, but they looked out and they saw what was happening. The rise of the United States, Germany, Japan, the Boer War, and they dramatically changed their grand strategy to deal with that changing world. That's getting it right. Getting it wrong is what Britain did in the 1930s. They saw the world changing around them, and they went to sleep. And they paid for it, and Europe paid for it, and the world paid for it. So that's on the American side. On the other side, you know, I would say the most important first step is get in the game. If we have this conversation in most of the emerging powers, certainly India, Brazil, 
uh, I wouldn't put China in that category fully. And uh, let's say all of us were, were in Brasilia right now or in New Delhi and said, well, what's your map of the 21st century? What do you think the world would look like? How should it be organized? You would get a completely blank stare and no answer. And that's because they're not, they're not thinking about this, and that's because they're very early on in their trajectory. Just to give you some sense, we have 12,000 diplomats in the Foreign Service. India has under 600. Brazil is just now opening embassies in Africa. It's opened like 15 embassies in, in the past few years because it hasn't had any there except in, in, in Brazilian territories. And so they're just sort of, sort of looking around and saying, whoa, what's going on here? China is, I think, a, the one rising power that is in this game. They have institutions and think tanks coming out of their ears. Uh, I don't know what, what exactly their views are on what the, what the next world should look like. I'm not sure they do, but I think they're thinking very hard about it. Uh, and so the first point I would make is, is, you know, let's get a debate going inside emerging powers and between us and emerging powers, as opposed to assuming that the status quo is stable moving forward. And the other is, is you know, I think that, as I mentioned uh, earlier on, regional experiments. I think that, you know, the European Union, ASEAN, Mercosur, these these are, are some of the most profound experiments in peace building and prosperity building of our time. Uh, and I would be investing heavily in those kinds of regional experiments, uh, especially if, if what I've been saying is correct. That is to say that, that the West is going to be sort of pulling back and ultimately responsibility for Africa will be up to the Africans, responsibility for Latin America to Latin Americans. Thank you. You know, you talked about this being the last 400 years being secular. I think I'd take 200, and then from 1800 to now, you've had, you've basically, we've basically had what the Muslims had, where socialism is a religion, a moral, a moral law and morality are together, and that's what's falling apart. That's what the argument in America is about. Do we want to live under this religion? Do we want to have, you know, the pe those people govern us? And that's what the fight here is. And that's when we saw the fall in 1990 of Russia. What you're having now is the reverberation here. Is that party going to fall here? It's going to fall in China because, just like the Russians ran out of guys who were willing to kill and to keep them up, I don't think the Chinese will be able to do it. And that's going to be the end of what happens. Uh, I'm not fully sure I get your question. Could you? No, no. I mean, the so I mean, socialism is coming to an end. That's what. Uh -huh. That's what's killing. That's what's driving our politics now. When the end of the government taking all this money. That's why incomes haven't grown. The government's gone from 20 percent to over 40 percent of the economy. You can't have growing incomes. You can't have people working when they do that. People aren't going to work when they only get a very small percentage of their income. OK, I, th I think and, I see where you're, where you're going now. And then, you know, in China, they're not going to be able to hold that together. The Russians weren't able to stand forever. How are they going to be able to stand? People aren't going to, they've had hundreds of millions of killed, and there's been no trials. There's been no trials against the Russians. These stupid Spanish judges have gone against, you know, guys in uh, South America or whatever, but they haven't gone and arrested any Russians, they haven't arrested any Chinese for their horrific crimes. And this has all been a cover-up taken by our universities and our politicians. Hungary's starting to do this. Hungary's going to go after them, and then it'll spread from country to country. Yeah, I would just make one, one um, quick response, and that is that I think that the one of the reasons that socialism didn't catch on here and did catch on elsewhere. We've just put it in. We put in, we're putting it in now. Is that we are fundamentally a middle class society and rose as a middle class society. Uh, and that one of the reasons that we are now stumbling is that our middle class is suffering. And as I said, expectations about the future 
are less rosy than they have been about the past. And I think that is threatening the fundamental suppositions that made the United States and Western Europe emerge as liberal, democratic, free market societies. And that's one of the reasons I think it's so important to recover the economic growth of the middle class. And, and I agree with you, but you've got to stop the other. Oh, the one wild card, I think, in your whole description is the uh, worsening global climate crisis and its impact not just on this nation, but on the entire nations of the world. And I would ask whether we could expect economic prosperity anywhere to ensue without dealing resolutely with the global climate crisis, irrespective of how much Russia, let's say, wants to capitalize on its fossil fuel basis. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had the vice president of the World Bank here from China indicate how, how desperately his country is suffering under the impact of uh, fossil fuel as a means of uh, as a means of bringing up the economy of the nation. So don't we really have to deal resolutely with the global climate crisis and uh, green technology sustainability in order to grow our economy here and also not throughout the world? I think it's a, a huge problem and it is, it falls into the category of the gap between the globalized nature of the challenges that we face and the insufficient supply of globalized governance. That is to say, you know, we, we incre increasingly live in a world in which uh, we face shared threats, threats that can be only dealt with sufficiently if we coordinate our responses. But what is happening, especially when it comes to climate change, is countries are saying, well, don't look at us. We don't want to pay the bill. You go pay the bill. It's a fundamental, classic, collective action problem. Uh, and uh, you know, if, if what's happened here in the United States over the last uh, few years is any indication, it's getting worse, not better. Right? I think Obama came into office truly committed to trying to do something about this. Uh, carbon trading system, tax on carbon, who knows exactly, and it's dead in the water. And that's simply because of the domestic politics and the difficulty of doing things like this in a, in a, in a period of, of economic distress. But I, I worry that we will see a series of issues like climate change. One could be, for example, trade and trade protectionism. We're already dealing with it when it comes to global rebalancing and, and currencies, where countries take an each, each for their own attitude rather than saying, listen, we're all in this together. And so one of the issues that I think we really do need to address is how to bring the, the, the sort of demand for global governance back into some rough equilibrium with the supply of that governance, which now is way down there. Please. Professor, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, very informative. Uh, the thesis is very interesting. Thank you. Uh, if, I wonder if you could spend more time talking about the Muslim countries. Um, Which countries? Muslim countries, uh -huh. Muslim countries. Uh, uh, how would they, what would be their situation in 2050? Uh, I mean, the theory I've, I've heard about Egypt and Tunisia is that because the secular governments have be, become despotic, you know, the the voting of the Muslims or the Islamists is, is reactionary because the secularists have failed their people. So do we expect them to go back to secularism? Uh, do you think that they would need to uh, get rid of Sharia and the Quran in order for them to be uh, a powerful uh, entity in 2050, perhaps? Mm. Well, I'm, uh, as you may have gathered, am somewhat worried about the near term. Uh, and I'm, I'm worried about the near term, partly because I think that the main beneficiaries of the, the so-called Arab Spring will be Islamists, and that the outside world is not going to like that. Uh, and that's going to sort of make people uncomfortable. And secondly, because I, I, I worry that with a few exceptions in the Middle East, and the exceptions being Turkey, Iran, Egypt, Tunisia, most of the countries in the region are 
contrived nation states. It is to say that they were patched together by departing colonial powers. And they do not have an organic national identity that, that has deep roots, with the, with the exception of the countries I mentioned. And what that means is that when you take off the coercive lid, long suppressed sectarian and tribal and ethnic divides are emerging to the surface. And that's why I think Syria is coming apart at the seams. I think Libya could come apart at the seams. Egypt and Tunisia are as good as it gets. When you go to countries that are, are, are really not held together by any strong sense of national identity and are tribal countries, like Iraq, like UAE, most of the Gulf, Afghanistan, uh, it's much more difficult to think about what sort of liberal democratic nation state looks like. And that's why I think we're going to see a lot of bloodshed along the path. Coming to sort of the, the, the end point, I guess, you know, if I had to say, you know, what, what, what might be a, a kind of optimistic take on, on this, it, I, I'd say, well, let's, let's watch Turkey. Uh, and Turkey is very interesting to me because it was always held out as the example of a democratic, secular Muslim country. But what's happening in Turkey is that the wealthier it's getting and the bigger its middle class is getting, the stronger the Islamist party is getting, right? Which is exactly the opposite of the story in the West. And so I think that what we may well end up with in Turkey is a model of an Islamist democracy, moderate Islam, a country that is broadly open to the world, that practices capitalism, but that, uh, but that operates in, uh, with, with its policies and its view on the world heavily informed by Islamic law. Uh, and that, that that mix is my guess uh, what, what the, what the will come out at the other end of a very turbulent period that I think will last several generations. Do you think there's a Bahlavi dynasty that could arise or a, a new Ataturk that could rise in the Middle East that would restore that secular progressive countries that we had in Iran and in Turkey and so on? Um, I think that there will be plenty of new strong men. Uh, I don't know if, it, if they will come from dynastic families. Right. Uh, but I mean, but, it's secular and strong and free. Yeah, I mean, I, and, and you know, this is probably heresy to say this, but we're better off with them, hmm. right? In the sense that, do we like the fact that, that Maliki is turning into a bit of a dictator? Hmm. No, we don't like that. But might Iraq actually survive as a unitary state because he exercises control? Yes. Should we be rushing into Afghanistan and Iraq with these big boxes of paper ballots and say, please vote? It's nuts, right? And so, uh, yeah, let's, it'd be great if Iraq is, is a democracy in, in, in you know, 50 years. But this mania of rushing into these countries with these deep ethnic sectarian cleavages and rushing them off to the election station seems to me to be folly. Right. Right. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was curious as to whether or not you believe that um, the lack of a driver you mentioned in the face of uh, competing conceptions of modernity sort of precludes the emergence, or a rather eventual emergence, of a global power, or whether this sort of no one's world has a degree of permanence to it? Well, you know, I, th I think that the, um, to the degree that there's a candidate out there, it's probably China because uh, of uh, the sheer numbers. Uh, I mean, we, we will have a, a country that if, if the growth continues, will will be, you know, very dominant. Uh, the, we don't know whether China will enjoy not just aggregate wealth, but also a much higher level of per capita GDP. We don't know whether China will translate 
its growing economic power into geopolitical power, right? What will its military spending be? History says that they will, right? There are only two countries that I can think of that haven't translated economic might into geopolitical might, and they're post-war Japan and post-war Germany. And those two countries were lobotomized, right? And that's why they uh, aren't, you know, they're punching below their weight. Uh, and, and I think it's a good thing that they're not, but countries that haven't been defeated and occupied and given constitutions generally follow a fairly straight line trajectory. Uh, so I, you know, I think that, uh, that China will, will probably be a dominant power, but not the dominant power. Partly because, as I said, I don't think their model will globalize. And partly, uh, you know, I think that there is an ethnocentrism to the Chinese that is, that is unlike the West. That is to say, if you go back to Chinese hegemony during the long uh, decades of, of various dynasties, it was very much Sinocentric. And the tribute system was based upon the spread, the cynicization of East Asia. It was not predatory imperial conquest. It was send tributes, it was ritualized, and maybe I'm ascribing too much weight to history and to culture, but I see that kind of, of, of Chinese influence emerging and not a China that wants to go out and, and run the world in the same way that, that the West did. So, uh, so I, my best guess is that it, it will be a decentralized, decentered world uh, for a long time to come. Could it be that a regional power sort of answers that space for a global power? Or? Well, that's why I think that, that we're heading toward a regionalized world and that China will be the big gorilla, but it's going to be largely in its region. And Brazil will probably end up creating some kind of political formation and integration in South America, but I do not expect to see Brazilian troops monitoring the Sino-Indian border. Uh, and that's why I think ultimately we'll see a more kind of farmed out and decentralized global system. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I appreciate your uh, mention of the Ottoman Empire and the broader historical context. Um, but further to that, uh, regarding the Middle East and regarding your uh, perception of uh, this uh, swing towards uh, political Islam, um, I would just uh, perhaps caution that view because I think we have to look at each country on an individual basis. And then when we look at the case of Egypt in the post Nasser era, we see uh, several decades of neoliberalism, and uh, this has been well explained by uh, Dr. Timothy Mitchell at Columbia University. Um, and we compare that situation uh, in Egypt. Uh, the reason, uh, as another speaker has mentioned, uh, about the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, who have traditionally stood for social welfare, I think it is not surprising to see. Uh, but if we compare the situation in Turkey, we have a rather different situation. We have, um, you know, in spite of the perception that uh, Erdogan is uh, from an Islamist party, um, he practices also uh, neoliberalism in Turkey, economic neoliberalism. And uh, I think uh, this, uh, I mean, we can also talk about the situation in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> you know, will there be any revolution in that country? And I would just like to say finally that uh, I think uh, in, in besides uh, military intervention, um, we also have to think about uh, the political support of uh, undemocratic uh, regimes. I mean, as was the case in Egypt for many decades, um, we do have to bear in mind, uh, I, as I say, with regards to the Middle East and this perception of political Islam, uh, we must look at the uh, recent histories of individual countries on a case-by-case -case basis because uh, I think we can find uh, many, many differences. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I agree with you. Um, I think that it's very dangerous to lump countries into big categories. Uh, and if you are charging me with having done so, then I mea culpa. Uh, that it, it is a sort of uh, danger that one stumbles upon when you try to write a book that's synthetic, synthetic and, and covers a lot of ground. Uh, and, and I think we will see many, many different kinds of outcomes in 
the Middle East. Uh, the main point I was trying to make is, is that there will be a kind of version of political life there, which because of the, of the intertwined and inseparable relationship between religion and politics, is going to follow a different path than the one that we're used to. Uh, and it's going to take lots of different forms in different countries, but it's simply a way of saying, hey, you know, they're on a different kind of, of cultural socioeconomic path than we are. Let's not expect them to look like us when this process comes to an end in, you know, and the Arab Spring reaches its fruition. Uh, thank you uh, for your talk, Professor Kupchan. Uh, the question I had in mind has kind of already been asked, but I'll sort of phrase it slightly differently because I want to ask that question. And that is that instead of it being no one's world, why isn't it going to be China's world? And the reason I ask that, there are two points. One is the Chinese are the only non-Western power today that is actively theorizing a non-Western version of political uh, modernity, what the so-called Beijing consensus, where they uh, combine Western industrial capitalism with autocracy. So they're, they're the only ones putting forward a new non-Western version of political modernity. And secondly, as you pointed out earlier, China is the only non-Western power that has some conception of what they want the 21st century to look like. So if we take both these two factors into account, in addition to the uh, Western um, lassitude, why, instead of no one's world, why aren't we going to see a replacement of Western hegemony with Chinese hegemony? Well, as I said, um, I, I do think China is in the game in the sense that they, they're thinking about this issue and they have a lot of people who are mapping out the Beijing consensus and figuring out what China's rise means and, and how, to, how to expand China's footprint. Uh, I think that, as I said, their model is not replicable on a universal basis, in part because it's not democratic and will therefore uh, fall short on various uh, moral grounds, on grounds uh, of legitimacy in, in, in different parts of the world. And I also expect that the Chinese model, like the Western model, is not uh, unblemished. And we're already hearing talk of the slowing down of Chinese growth, of the need for the financial system in China to be liberalized if it's going to function effectively. Loans need to be made on the basis of their credit worthiness and not because your friend in the Communist Party picks you, picks up the phone and says, give a loan to X, X company. So uh, I think there are plenty of chinks in the armor. Uh, and as I, as I said, I, and, and this is more speculative, uh, I, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I do think that there is a, uh, uh, an ethnocentrism to China and Chinese culture that, that is different. I mean, I think Americans are somewhat unique in that we sort of go out into the world and, and kind of peddle who we are. We peddle our, peddle, peddle our values. And I think that in China there is more of an ethnic uh, self-identity uh, and that they don't go to India or they don't go to Brazil and, they, and say, well, we think that you should embrace Chinese values and Chinese way of doing things because I think they think that's for Chinese. Uh, and, uh, and that, again, is speculative, and it's partly based upon Chinese history. And it may be that when China has the ability and the wherewithal to be a universalizing power, it chooses to do so. But I don't see signs uh, of that happening, at least yet. Uh, and that's why I'm betting on no one's world rather than a Chinese century. There's only one point I'll say in quick response, that the veneer of democracy in the non-Western world is probably a lot more weaker than you expect. For example, India is often posited as this great uh, example of a non-Western democracy. But if you go out and discuss and talk to the common people, they're not as committed to democratic and liberal norms as you would think. So perhaps 
they could one day, if Chinese power grows, they could one day embrace a more autocratic structure. But right. No, so I mean, I completely that. agree with you. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think one often holds India out as this leading example. Uh, and, and, and in my view, you know, India has done well despite the fact that it's a democracy, not because it's a democracy. Uh, and I've only been to India a couple of times, but I, I, every time I, I go, I am just baffled that the place functions at all. <laughs> uh, because the, the ethnic and, and linguistic diversity is, is mind boggling. Uh, and the fact that you, you, know, you have a, a, a democratic government that makes it through the day is quite impressive. Uh, the only problem is it just makes it through the day. <laughs> So please, uh, please do stay for the books and the book signing at the seminary co-op table in the back of the room. And uh, we thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.